uh, teleconnection. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the issue around the connection between tipping points is the, the whole uh, concept of cascading, and, and which uh, Lenton and Mackay and, and others um, have described. And so there's uh, the general theory in the Mackay paper is that mm. the uh, melting of the ice is the um, starting point for a series of cascading uh, tipping points. It's nice to see uh, Peter Wadhams uh, here. Hello, uh, Peter. I haven't seen you for a while. No, I've been overworking on other things. <laughs> Uh, hope you're well, Peter. Um, well, I'm okay. I've got some uh, problem with my legs, so I can, I'm a bit immobile at the moment. Okay, and are, are you in Italy or, or England? No, in Italy, uh, in Turin, um, at, at the Polytechnic. Hmm. So what's um, what's going on in, in the um, Polytechnic? Have you got any uh, research going on uh, relevant uh, to climate change? Uh, yes, we've been collecting um, ice samples from the Greenland ice sheet and then matching them with soot samples from, from brush fires in Sardinia to see if it's the same, uh, it's the same type of carbon or what and uh, so we're, uh, we're bringing out a paper on that shortly. Um, in fact the, uh, the soot from brush fires is actually a large part of it is, is full of rooms which is uh, it's a tough form of carbon that was discovered not many years ago. The guy who discovered it got a Nobel Prize which, uh, I, given how much of it there is, around, <laughs> he probably didn't deserve his, his Nobel Prize, but anyway, he got it. And uh, uh, he, uh, it, it's, it's the, the type of soot that, that coats branches of trees when they're burnt, burnt out in fires. That's interesting. I thought it was a very rare thing, and so, yes. <laughs> it actually turns out to be rather common. <laughs> yes, so did I. I thought it was very rare. In fact, I knew the guy, who, Harold Croto, who discovered this, and he was made a tremendous big thing out of it, got the Nobel Prize. He, he went and lived in Florida, and uh, he, he, he was... Because uh, everybody thought that he'd made... This, this amazing discovery of this very, very rare form of carbon. But when you actually sample the, uh, look, at, look at the samples that you collect from, from so, sooty branches, you find it's, it's actually crawling with fullerenes. I mean, fullerenes are one of the most uh, common forms of carbon there is, it seems. Uh, so it's, uh, I think he was just very, very lucky that he, you ran into them first. So, um, do so. Do we need any uh, introductions before we start? Uh, uh, Peter, you may you may not know all the faces here. Um, um, I know most, most of them, yeah. Right. Um, Cloud Pear, I don't think it's your name, is it? <laughs> no, What's it's your... Rebecca, Rebecca Gordon. Um, okay. I remember the Rebecca bit, but uh, okay, Gordon. Cloud Pear is my email. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and uh, okay, I think we've 
we've had uh, everybody else on one of these prank calls if not do say so have, have you been on one of our calls Stephen? yes Stephen. Uh, i'm 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 not sure john uh, <laughs> you get muddled up with all these groups <laughs> I, that, that is exactly right yes but uh, my name is Stephen Penningroth. I'm in uh, Ithaca, just outside Ithaca, New York. And I'm a retired academic and nonprofit director. And uh, uh, Peter, I read your book uh, recently with great interest. Uh, since I retired a year ago, I've become a student of climate. And, uh, and your book has been extremely helpful. Uh, Good. So. <laughs> How do you like it? I did. Yes, thank you. Well, uh... Uh, Peter's referring to fa Farewell to Ice, which has been an inspiration for many of us. Uh, and, well, um, it, it, I, just, I just got the uh, latest statement from my publisher, which means it, it, it's, it's been inspiring in Italy, but not in England. That, that oh, yeah. Over the last year, they sold about, penguins sold about two copies, whereas the Italian publisher has been selling them like hot cakes so i don't know what that means it means maybe oh. penguin, <laughs> penguin isn't putting in the oh. effort it's a profit in uh, is unknown in their own country isn't that it's not that a yes. effect yes i think that's it it's uh, yeah. uh <laughs> um yes talking about your book one of the one of the extraordinary things you describe is the the vortices or vortexes uh for driving the amok and um uh and i think you said uh, the other day that to me personally that that they disappeared is that uh, correct um oh yes yes it's the the whole um AMOC has rearranged itself so that um, mm. the what used to be the, the chimney vortexes were vanished, and um, it's it's really become uh, a, a more boring kind of circulation now, and uh, people I don't quite know what that's what that implies in terms of. Um, ocean circulation and uh, uh, heat flow in the future but we'll, we'll see when it, as it develops yeah uh, so the, the strength hasn't declined well it's declined 40 percent uh, which means that it's kind of 60 percent of what it was um uh but it's the warming, it's the warming in the Arctic which has stopped the vortices, isn't it? Basically. Well, um, yes, Which... except that um, there's, there's lots of evidence, of course, of anomalous circulation in the Antarctic now. So somehow uh, the whole the whole system is is readjusting itself, and I don't quite know what that is leading to, but. Um, it, it, there's, there's a change in the in the uh, Antarctic circulation as well as the Arctic. Um, yes, because the when, when there's less um, say saline, cold saline water falling down over that waterfall uh, between is it was an underwater. To waterfall, a huge waterfall uh, off Norway, isn't there? Uh, yes, yes, it's a which, interesting feature. Yeah. Which which drives uh, which drives the uh, Amok, uh, so you get bottom water. Now I heard that that bottom water um, uh, becomes eventually becomes uh, uh, middle layer water when it reaches the Antarctic and can't even come to the surface and that has a warming effect on the uh, on the Antarctic glaciers but um, it's happened too quickly um, 
because the, the actual current would, would take up to 100 years uh, to get from the Arctic to the Antarctic, if, if not longer. Um, yes, everything's happening very much faster. And, and as uh, I think as I was uh, uh, listening to the, uh, uh, the, the, the talk by Smart uh, by, by, uh, earlier today, which was a repeat of the one uh, uh, the one that was on two days ago. So in fact, I, I saw all of you lot <laughs> at his talk. <laughs> uh, and um, he, he was emphasizing how the speed of things is, is, is one of the ghastly aspects of, of climate change. Um, it means things like the uh, the effect of the, the change of currents in the Antarctic and their effect on on ice shelves, for instance, is mm. so happening much faster. So everything um, everything is something that one has to worry more about than in the past. <clears throat> yeah, it it's a, there's a huge contrast between the laid back um, attitude of of the people studying, researching solar engineering and the people who are studying the needs for action, <laughs> truly action. Uh, yes, that's one of the things he was saying. <laughs> well, of course, what he was mainly complaining about was uh, IPCC and how um, useless it is and uh, how slow to take action and how uh, how much it really doesn't doesn't really fit in with what we need, how fast we need to go, and what we need to do to to be able to 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 fight against climate change. Um, he, he's got a definite thing against intergovernmental panel on climate change, as I guess has has everybody who's had any contact with them. Yeah, but they they seem to be the uh, the ruling body when it comes to uh, government policy, and also from the view of climate activists. The climate activists believe that you know the IPCC statements are the science. The science. Yes. Um, yes. Hmm. And yes, how wrong they are. Yeah. How wrong they are. <laughs> Daniel, did you want to say something? Yeah, actually, you know, just uh, mentioning that the word contrast, it, it brought to mind obviously the um, the albedo loss that you point out in that article you you got published in the Canberra Times, Robert, and uh, the fact that as observed by satellites, has been a one point eight percent reduction in the Earth's albedo. Is that um so I mean, since the year 2000 um is that right robert and yes and if well, so that's worryingly high, that's about well that's more than three times the albedo gain that um stephen salter identified as the um the the amount that would need to be um you know 0.5 percent increase in albedo he thought was enough to offset um all global warming or you know at least uh from greenhouse gases was the figure he used and he said it was based on julia slingo's figure of 1.7 watts per meter squared uh net warming um which might be from ar5 i'm not sure where exactly got it but that figure of 1.8 percent decrease in the world's al albedo which is presumably a, a loss of arctic ice combined with other uh, land land use change and that sort of thing, but that's that's huge um, in comparison, and presumably that means then for using albedo modification as a um, as a tool to you know offset um, the the warming, you'd need to ramp it up. You know, he was talking about fleets of uh, eight hundred ships uh, of those boats. He's designed it would need then three times as much, presumably, but 
Um, yeah, that that was my thought when you when you mentioned that, especially as I've been trying to help uh, uh, do a website for him, which I sort of you know was flagging up that only you know only 0.5 percent increase in albedo may be enough to um, you know offset global warming, but that's way mm. short, isn't it? If there's a that 1.8 percent loss. Well, this is the chart that uh, I made this um, from the cloud and the Earth's radiant energy system, the Sarah's um, data, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, that's the link. And uh, and what I did was that the the original data uh, is monthly, mm -hmm. and uh, and so the the monthly albedo figure has gotten an an, an annual uh, uh, pattern, uh, uh, like the Keeling curve. And uh, so the trend is is not very mm. on the annual data, but uh, so so I extracted it. Uh, so what I did was I took an average uh, um, of of each year's point, and uh, and then uh, just just graphed uh, graphed it in order to to fill the whole screen. And um, and so uh, the the interesting thing is that the um, radiative uh, sorry, the um, the outgoing um, radiation, the albedo, is uh, is about one hundred, and so it's it's basically equal to a percentage. Uh, so the the incoming is um, three forty watts per square meter, and the outgoing used to be about a hundred, and is is now down to uh, close to ninety eight. And the uh, the Sarah's um, website provides monthly updates. And uh, so the uh, the last one was uh, January uh, this year, and so I, I think um, uh, tracking the albedo is uh, is something that's uh, that's quite useful to uh, to get a sense of the darkening of the planet. And uh, I find uh, that concept of the darkening of the planet is uh, again, you know, just like brightening has got a whole series of uh, metaphorical meanings. Um, uh, so too does uh, does darkening, and uh, we've been seeing the darkening of the planet with the Ukraine war and various other uh, 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 difficult things. But uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I was I was happy to get the article uh, published as you mentioned, uh, Daniel, mm -hmm. and uh, it uh, once again, you know, I, I think that it's uh, it's a topic that uh, just Creates a lot of cognitive dissonance for most people, and um, so uh, uh, there's uh, there's a general uh, failure to uh, to engage on these issues. Um, and uh, but you know I think that, you know continuing to uh, push the uh, the discussion is uh, uh, is essential. Hmm. Well, can yeah. can you put it on the uh, on the sharing? What? Again. Uh, oh, sorry, Peter. What what sharing do you uh, oh. do you mean? Uh, no, I I just wondered that the the paper itself and uh, I, I can you can you send a, send it or put it on. Uh, well, the article that I wrote, uh, I have mm. circulated um, by email, um, and uh, I uh, I didn't include, and then I also included this um, albedo chart that I've just uh, put up on the screen. So, kind of an email from me. Right, right. There's an interesting decline in albedo of. Uh, uh, that period. I mean, it's uh, uh, you. It, it, it would have had a noticeable effect on the radiation balance of the planet. That's right. It's it's a two percent fall, and uh, mm. uh, or, or, which equates to a two percent increase in radiative forcing. Uh, so, uh, and also, uh, I, I'm not quite sure how the uh, watts per square meter um, of albedo feeds into the overall radiative forcing 
figure because it, it, it's uh, I, I found some of the scientific reporting on quite confusing because it, it's like they um, they underestimate the albedo factor. Hmm. Okay, that's... Yeah. It seems to be uh, something that that is uh, is not is not very not done very clearly in the, um, in the analyses. Um, yeah, like it's it's valuable to have this. There's the two methods that they use. There's both the uh, the Sarah's satellite that uh, was the, the source of the data I just had there, and then the earlier uh, uh, method of just measuring the uh, the brightness of the dark side of the moon um, uh, during the new moon and uh, the dark side of the moon measurements of Earthshine uh, just gave a figure of um, uh, half a watt or uh, um, uh, and uh, half a percent uh, whereas the satellite data seems much more accurate uh, um, so uh, that's uh, approach um, two watts uh, per mm. square of uh, of reflection. Yeah. Um, so does that that, that the well, one of the reasons for that, of course, is that the Arctic is contributing uh, about one percent of mm. that two percent, and the Arctic doesn't get uh, represented in the, in the reflections of the moon. Uh, so you you see the uh, sun brightening uh, in the tropics and subtropics and so on, uh, which which could be just um, a bit, uh, sorry uh, uh, opposite of brightening and uh, darkening, <laughs> loss loss of albedo, uh, uh, which could be due to a decline in uh cloud cover yeah there are three main factors so it's uh, mm. the low clouds over the ocean as the ocean warms uh the the cloud cover has been declining and uh, one of the papers said that that's the uh, that's the main um albedo loss uh, uh, but then also the snow and ice melts and the uh, black carbon uh, uh, which uh, Peter was mentioning the research on black carbon uh, he's he's been doing uh, so uh, as I understand it those are the three biggest factors and it just illustrates that um, if we don't uh, move immediately to uh, uh, create an equal and opposite cooling uh, effect to uh, balance the heating uh, from albedo loss then uh, we've we just face an inevitable climate collapse. So uh, I, I really do do not understand uh, how the IPCC can possibly justify uh, just completely ignoring albedo from uh, from any policy. Like it, it's it's based on politics rather than science. Uh, so, and... uh, so do you say the IPCC's sort of figures for? net warming or you know uh, net radiative forcing does not take into account albedo loss uh look um i think do you that the, under i think that the, the net radiative forcing is uh, is something that is measured uh, at the top of the atmosphere uh, by satellites and uh, so like always with uh, climate data there's both uh, calculated uh, approaches from models and uh, and physical measurements, and uh, so this uh, uh, loss of albedo is a physical measurement, and uh, and how that relates to the overall warming situation in terms of uh, greenhouse gases uh, is something I don't uh, fully understand by any means. Um, but uh, the uh, the issue is that um, the the policy is that we must not do anything about albedo because uh, to do so would uh, only encourage people to uh, uh, to reject uh, uh, the need for emission reduction and uh, and that's 
I think that that's the key issue. That that this uh, this argument that uh, albedo has to be um, systematically excluded from a climate response for moral hazard reasons is uh, is incredibly dangerous because we're just laying ourselves wide open to sudden sudden tipping points. Uh, I'm I'm really interested in the uh, uh, how this relates to Earth system sensitivity. Uh, because uh, my impression is that uh, the the Earth system is just far more sensitive than uh, the, uh, the models uh, suggest. That, that the complacency of the IPCC policy suggests. So um, yeah, uh, with the uh, with the coming um, El Nino and uh, it, this decade uh, just. Uh, is shaping up to be, uh, you know, uh, quite dangerous. <clears throat> Evan, to to whom should uh, these arguments be addressed? Do we try to get the IPCC to do better? I don't think we have the prestige to do that. We need to address uh, someone else who does have the prestige to. Uh, fight them or tell governments to ignore them or tell governments to to act uh, <clears throat> despite the complacency suggested by the IPCC. Who's taking I action think, and to whom? I, I think we might, um, it's just occurred to me, we might uh, write to uh, George Soros, who people uh, listen to. He's a bit of a maverick, considered a bit of a maverick. Uh, but his uh, talk um, to the security conference in, uh, I think it was, might have been in Davos, uh, was brilliant. And he included refreezing the Arctic. I think if we gave him our arguments, he'd be, he could be even more forceful. And he's very eloquent. And he's got the contacts and people listen to him. Um, so uh, just an idea of having, we, we've always been trying to persuade people who are probably unpersuadable, <laughs> so uh, it might be good to, to try somebody who's already on our side. <laughs> mm. yeah. Well, Sir David King worked with him on that video, so um, he's already... You know, probably approached him to do with his uh, Cambridge Centre for Climate Repair and that sort of thing. It was talked about in the video, which was made by George Soros. You know, obviously it was uh, a video that was sponsored by George Soros. Um, it was through him that a video company produced it and interviewed David King. So, uh, and it talked about marine cloud brightening specifically, although it didn't. I don't think it called it marine cloud brightening. But it had an animation of uh, Stephen Salter's uh, hydrofoil vessel designs. So, uh, has everyone seen that video? It's, um... Yeah, it was great, and uh, like it, it, it explicitly referenced Stephen Salter's uh, work, mm. uh, and, and um, so uh, yeah, like I, I think um, Evan, the uh, just getting more into the mainstream media, I think, is uh, a key objective. Because, uh, like, the, uh, the, I mean, that's why I um, was pleased to get that article published in the Canberra Times, which is it's just a um, a, a, a relatively small newspaper, uh, not a national one. But you know, being able to my my observation is that this material just uh, gets completely ignored. It's just very difficult to get any attention to uh, to these these questions now we've uh, we've got three people with hands up we've got paul and stephen and jonathan so uh, so let's hear from paul hi i'm paul anderson i'm in america i'm sorry that i can't get my camera to work i've attended one of the meetings before i'm in the some of these other groups and things i've seen a lot of your items uh, if i could take a, a minute to relate to how it is my I will say that I have a PhD from the Australian National University, so I hope that brings a, a grin from a few people. It's in the field of demography, 
but my my actual work is in geography. I did migration studies for the demography part, but as a geography professor, now retired, I'm 79 years old. I've been retired for 20 years, but I studied early, you know, way back decades ago about, um, wasn't so much about climate, but it was about planetary things and stuff like that. So I've got some of this physical background and things on it. What brings me to this discussion is um, that I, uh, first of all, I, a, a bit of background. After I retired, as I was retiring from teaching, I became involved in what would now be called biochar, okay? Microgasification, which is carbon dioxide removal technology, really adamant and active and things in it. In the last year, I have be and I've become quite convinced of how carbon dioxide removal is not going to accomplish what needs to be done. I mean, I'm a big advocate for it. I can speak from within that circle of, of activities and things, but the we the issue of global brightening, I am not a big advocate of stuff that's stratospheric outside of the, you know, outside of the troposphere, but uh, Arctic refreezing, et cetera, is very interesting. So in terms of what I am doing, I am a, uh, uh, I'm a Rotarian for more than 40 years and I've contact with, with Rotarians. And if they are typical of let's call them adults who would like to be knowledgeable but are not very technical and scientific. They could be a reasonable uh, a target audience and getting some things going. I'm, I'm after the, the, the presentation to the general public of the issues of uh, uh, global um, brightening or global cooling, that many different ways that, it, that it's stated in there. So that's probably where I hope to have some contribution in with this. And I appreciate, I got in a little bit late to the meeting today, but I saw the, the key graph on the, uh, the decline of the uh, uh, measurements. I'd like to get copies of that. I'd ask if somehow either through chat or uh, in these, uh, in the discussion group that that link to George Soros's video, I think there's a video of his presentation or at least an audio recording. Uh, could we could we get that uh, so I can find it directly? And I hope to uh, work a few things through. I think many of you know Doug uh, Grant, who's uh, been involved in it. He's good at graphics, uh, become a friend of mine through telephone and stuff. And I think I'll be working with him a lot trying to get the graphics and the things out there for this general message. So that's a pretty <clears throat> long interjection in here, but I'm, I want to say the things, the discussion today and the level of detail that comes here um, uh, is uh, what's needed as the essential backdrop for everything which I'm hoping to help present around to people. <laughs> Thank you. Look, thanks very much, Paul. It's really nice to have you on the call. And uh, uh, I've uh, seen your work on uh, biochar in, in particular, and uh, just it's very impressive. Uh, the uh, uh, like you're really a, a world leader in some of the uh, the biochar <coughs> and deployment. So uh, yes, uh, Soros uh, provided a uh, a video um, uh, which. Uh, to the Munich Security Conference uh, earlier this year, and um, I, I I see uh, you put out an email request for um, slides on uh, Albedo. Uh, I've uh, uh, given a, a series of talks recently in which uh, I've um, put together various um, uh, arguments for. Uh, giving priority to Albedo, and I'm happy to share those uh, with you. All right, thanks, Paul. So, uh, Stephen, so, so you're, you're going to share those. How are you going to share those through the through the discussion group or chat? Uh, or you have my personal. E yeah, look, uh, I, I got your email, so uh, I'll 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 send it to you. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay.
Yes. Uh, so, so uh, Robert, if you could send them to me as well, I'd appreciate it. Uh, so Paul Anderson basically said what uh, the kind of thing that I was going to say, which is that uh, rather than trying to uh, uh, reach, you know, opinion makers and influencers and and famous people, it might be a good idea to start at the grassroots. And um, and so I've been trying to think of how to put together a presentation for lay people uh, that I could um, just present here in, in my own community in Ithaca to interested groups. And I'm sure there's, uh, there's more than one. I could start with the local senior citizen center uh, and uh, maybe from there move to Kendall where there are a number of uh, retired folks who are very, uh, very knowledgeable, but even if they're not, the point is that I, I think it's a, I, I think that lay people may be more open to these concepts than um, uh, the IPCC or policymakers. You know, I I do believe that politicians in general follow; they don't lead. And if there's enough of a uh, in, if there's enough interest and enough understanding. Uh, at the grassroots level, I'm just calling it grassroots. I mean, the body politic, I mean, people who vote is really what I mean. Um, then uh, that could be an effective uh, way to, you know, get these ideas into the public conversation. Because like, uh, you know, like you, like all of you, I think I'm just struck by the disconnect between what I have learned over the past year is the science of warming and how, you know, climate change is not only locked in, uh, well, could be locked in very soon and tipping points may lock it in even sooner. Um, and then the general idea that net zero by 2050 is just hunky-dory, you know, and that we're all fine. Uh, so that disconnect, I think, needs to be, as all of you are saying, needs to be addressed. And I think that, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in climate, I have a PhD, but in, in cell biology, so it's hardly relevant here. And, um, uh, but I'm, I know enough to be able to hopefully, you know, make a pitch to uh, general audiences. And so I would appreciate any and all, uh, you know, slides uh, uh, that, you know, might be helpful in that, uh, in that undertaking. I mean, my, my feeling is that uh, getting into the mainstream media uh, with uh, op-eds in uh, or other uh, similarly uh, influential and uh, large scale uh, newspapers uh, ought to be a, a key goal because uh, you know none of this material, I think, has has been presented to the general public in that way. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, uh, I, I agree, Robin, and I, I really, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> I really liked your article, and uh, and I think you're absolutely right, and I, I think it, as far as getting these ideas out in the public, it needs to be all of the above, and I think that, uh, you know, you are so knowledgeable that you're able to write, you know, op-ed pieces that 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 people can read and, and become informed. I, I don't, I, I'm not able to do that. I don't have the background, uh, but what I can do is talk to people. And mm -hmm. so uh, that's, I think, you know, what I will be trying to do. Thank and you, you. Often, you often find that, uh, that talking to people in your local community will uh, uh, open up uh, avenues for, uh, for reaching people more, more broadly and just, just engaging people like, you know, building uh, a movement of awareness is just so yes all right now uh jonathan wanted to speak hey thanks hey i've been reading um herb simmons new book got the fresh copy a climate vocabulary of the future second edition and um he's got two words in here that are along the lines of what we're talking about he's got backfire effect and rebound effect and um, I think when we're confronted with an ongoing 
the rational argument, the argument that we shouldn't cool the planet because somehow it will cause people to burn more gasoline because they won't feel as much threat or something like that. Um, I think when confronted with an irrational argument that keeps persisting, it just won't go away. Uh, we have to make an exhaustive list of other areas of life where similar things are done. Like, let's say you have a smoker in a house and everyone is disgusted by the amount of secondhand smoke. So they get a big air cleaning machine in the house and it sucks up the air and, and filters out all the smoke. Uh, yeah, you could say, well, they'll just uh, smoke an extra cigarette every hour now that uh, <laughs> it's not so disgusting in there. Um, or you have somebody that's taking heroin or something like that, and you give them a, a different opiate. Um, you know, you might say, well, they're just still addicted to opiums and, uh, you know, they're just going to keep going. In other words, if we have an exhaustive list of things that are similar in life, where we could do sort of a reductio ad absurdum on the argument, we might be eventually able to chip away at this. Uh, so, if, so if anyone else has any, they can just call them out. You know, like what what is similar to this? If you help the problem a little bit, the addict, in, in this case, an oil addict, will just keep using more. Mm. It's the general um, theory of moral yeah. hazard um, insurance. John? Yeah, uh, can I commend, uh, I think you came up with a brilliant example of uh, the difference between emergency action and uh, kind of normal action <laughs> with oh, your okay. shoelaces. Shoe yeah, right. now I thought that was brilliant. Let me tell the others who haven't heard it, uh, if I can get it this right. Um, if, you, uh, if you leave your shoelaces undone, um uh you you're, you ought to be doing up your shoelaces uh that's a kind of low priority thing <laughs> but if you then trip up on the shoelaces you have to take emergency action otherwise you get uh you you really hurt yourself so um so it's an emergency and and the ipcc is going to be working on on doing up the shoelaces and uh, uh, and then we've got tipping points, which are exactly analogous to your tripping on the uh, over the shoelaces. And uh, we now have need emergency ac action and the kind of doing up your shoelaces while you're uh, focusing on doing up your shoelaces while you're tripping over and trying to s s prevent uh, catastrophic impacts is is uh, is what's actually happening at this very moment uh, with the IPCC still talking uh, about uh, the net zero is the answer to everything um, right right yeah once once the um, emergency is triggered by catching your foot on your shoelace uh, the shoelaces are now irrelevant now the emergency is the impact with the ground that's going to happen within one second. Mm -hmm. And so it, the shoelaces are now irrelevant. They were a thing from the past. Now it's all about positioning your arms, trying to have a soft landing, and the shoelaces are a problem of the past. Um, yeah, so some sort of cartoon where someone tries while falling to reach back and tie their shoelaces while their head hits the pavement might, might be a, you know, a, a visualization of that one. I think you can embellish the story by having this person walking across concrete, a field of grass, a place with obstacles and things in it, and we're paying attention to the wrong things. Right. Still on the shoelace, or is there a different? No, no, the shoelace is part of it. I mean, it's wearing shoes. Maybe they, they, they only have they're only wearing one shoe or they got sandals or the, the shoes are worn out or the shoes have more than one set of shoelaces sticking out of them. They've become, I mean, there's, it's a complicated issue, but it's a, it, shoelaces are understood by people as being something that will cause you to trip. Right, right. 
Okay. Well, I just wanted to put it out there, the idea that um, as an ongoing exercise, perhaps we should make an exhaustive list of, of the things that everyone experiences in life or a great many people experience, some of them. And it just shows the uh, irrationality of not taking emergency action because there's this other action that you should have taken in the past or maybe you should still take it now. You know, um, and then there's the other thing with the addict where you try to take the addict off of their drug by doing something else, but then the addict defeats you by, by using that opportunity to take more of the, the drug of choice. Um, anyway, just wanted to throw that out there. Look, I think that the, uh, the psychology there is uh, actually far more uh, complex than uh, people recognize because it's almost as though uh, people uh, view uh, humanity as a plague upon the planet and uh, think that it would be a good thing if uh, our civilization collapses. Uh, like, and uh, which I find a, a very disturbing sort of mentality, but uh, it's it's the almost the only way I can understand uh, why people would be uh, unwilling to support action that would uh, stabilize the climate. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's like uh, you know we uh, we've created such destruction that uh, we deserve to uh, uh, to collapse. Uh, as a uh, as a global civilization, and and I think that that sort of that sort of thinking is just terrible. But uh, it's uh, 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 you know just putting it to people is is that what you actually think? You know, do you actually want to see uh, a collapse of uh, of the of um, the world economy? Um, now there are many people who will say yes, uh, they do want that, but uh, I think that that's Quite a small minority, and uh, and opening up the suggestion that that's the that's the implication of the moral hazard reasoning and and of the opposition to brightening the planet. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, John, were you were you finished? Uh, um, no, I got uh, a, a couple of things. Um, uh, so. Going right back uh, to Peter Wadhams, who who we must uh, welcome, particularly for his expertise. The one other thing that David Spratt said in his article, because I didn't attend his lecture, unfortunately, uh, is that the um, the reduction in AMOC has could is affecting the Amazon. Uh, have you heard of that one, Peter? Um, yes, I think he mentioned it, but I, 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 I don't know what the context is because I, I, I couldn't imagine how changing a mock would affect the Amazon. That's a, something I'll have to chase him up on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, I'll skip to the kind of main thing that uh, we discussed last um, uh, at the last session, that's a fortnight ago, uh, less a day, because it was a Tuesday. And we'll try and stick to Mondays hereafter um, uh, for, for, for us in the UK and the US, it's of course Tuesdays in Australia. Um, Sorry, John. So, just just so, so, on, on that connection between the AMOC and uh, and the Amazon, uh, yeah. it, it is something that is uh, that is recognised in the uh, mainstream climate science. So what what you see with this chart, which is uh, from Lenton at Al, is that the uh, the connectivities uh, include <coughs> the Atlantic Circle. Uh, so. Uh, various things that are causing, uh, so the Greenland ice sheet and the Arctic sea ice reduction are causing the slowdown of the AMOC. And then the AMOC in turn is causing more frequent droughts 
uh, in the Amazon and the uh, West Antarctic and the uh, and East Antarctic uh, ice loss. So, uh, uh, yeah, there's uh, it's not something that uh, that David Spratt has made up. It's it's the, it's there in uh, in the peer reviewed published science. Hmm. Um, yeah, um, what they own, uh, November 2019, right, okay. Right, I just want to make a note of that. Okay, well, um, so that, that, that's interesting. Um, uh, yeah, um, last, last time we had uh, uh, Brian on the called Brian from Hudson on the call, and he made a suggestion for um, uh, a, a field trial uh, of stratospheric uh, aerosol, um, which, which would be extremely easy to do, uh, providing you got you know, permission to do it, was uh, to, to, change, to allow pilots to switch tanks uh, between tanks of normal highly refined jet fuel and less refined jet fuel that still had some sulfur in it <clears throat> and you could look at the contrails uh, from space and uh, see the, the ones that were pers persisting and you could kind of measure you get some kind of measurement of the uh, al albedo effect. And um, this would be an entry into stratospheric aerosol injection for specifically for refreezing the Arctic, which is, which is where I think it's going to be a key, uh, a key um, tool. The unfortunately, Marine cloud brightening, I don't think, can produce enough cooling in the Arctic um, to deal with the kind of what one watt per square meter, <clears throat> which uh, Peter and I reckon the uh, the albedo loss could now now be as much as. Um, yeah. So the series satellite, when it says the planet's lost uh, two watts per square meter. One one watt could be uh, easily be coming from the from the Arctic, and um, so marine cloud brightening uh, could only produce about uh, a tenth of the re required cooling, uh, whereas a stratospheric aerosol could uh, produce as uh, uh, enough or, or more than is needed. Um, so that's uh, uh, that's a, a, in effect a, a showstopper for marine cloud brightening. Unless I've got my calculations all wrong, I have um, checked. Could I, just... I have asked Stephen Salter to check them. Um, <clears throat> Has Stephen come back with it, with any calculations on the maximum um, uh, albedo effect of marine cloud brightening in watts per square metre? Well, well, he, he did, did come. Sorry, uh, yeah, you can answer Sorry. that probably, Daniel. Uh, well, as, as I say, um, he, he, he thinks that um, the 1.7 watts per square metre um, corresponding to 0.5% brightening needed is is something that they're capable uh, you know it's capable of with a certain amount of you know hundreds of uh, boats of his uh, fleet yeah, so that, yeah. that so, is something so, that he, so, he, so it's, he so it's that okay capable of that it's level. okay for it, it it may well be uh, capable of dealing with global warming but the, the, the need in the arctic is is to inject uh uh, the necessary cooling power uh, into the Arctic, and you need to be cooling the clouds over the water that's flowing into the uh, Arctic, and perhaps even some direct cooling within the Arctic itself. 
um, it's just not enough. Um, there's uh, something that may be more promising that hasn't been looked into is is cloud uh, removal uh, in the winter. You could get a hugely increased cooling by letting out the uh, thermal radiation more effectively. Uh, and I'm not sure what the cloud cover is, is like. Uh, Peter, do you, have, do you know what the winter cloud cover is like in, in the Arctic? Well, no, not, uh, not in relation to summer cloud cover. I mean, it's uh, it's just uh, the, the marine cloud brightening is, is done because marine clouds are grey and horrible and, and nasty. So uh, I imagine they are the same in the winter in, uh, as in the summer in, in the Arctic. So it's, uh, uh, I, I don't know how you would distinguish well, between. The, the, there's probably cloud uh, cover um, sat satellite measurements. It's quite difficult to do cloud cover in the Arctic winter, but I, I'm sure there must be methods of, of doing it. Um, but there's no, no sunshine in the winter. Well, that's e exactly. And satellites see the clouds because of the sunshine on them. Um, in winter, the clouds is, uh, are probably, may not be visible. I don't know. Uh, perhaps you see moonshine on them. <laughs> It's where this theory of cirrus cloud thinning as a radiative um, approach to cooling, as distinct from an albedo approach, is uh, is of value. Uh, that if you if you do take the extra blanket off in the winter, then the heat uh, from the from the Arctic will escape to space. So uh, that's ju it's just another cooling method that needs to be uh, understood and supported. Yeah, I. I, I... I have uh, talked or at least emailed to uh, the main advocate, uh, David Mitchell, on, on, on that. And he reckoned the um, amount of uh, cooling power wasn't, wasn't nearly enough uh, to, to refreeze the Arctic. All right. Why don't we move on to, uh, to Daniel? So, so. Uh, so Come so on. let me continue with this um, oh, go on. Go on, John. because this idea of the aircraft is is the is exactly the kind of field trial that the atomic uh, uh the bulletin of the atomic scientists uh letter um, <laughs> talks about the letter from hansen and others saying there needs to be research on srm so i'm proposed to write to them uh, and with this proposal and see what the uh, reaction is because if they if they were to support it uh, that would be great and they are a known body of scientists who are extremely concerned uh, about the kind of security risk that climate change poses you know, they put it on a par with the nuclear threat. And that's 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 why they it it comes under their auspices as atomic scientists. Mm. So uh, so I'll take that on as a as an action. I th I think Brian's idea is, is brilliant. It's it's very uh, kind of low key, but actually could provide some some data on the effective uh, cooling that you can produce from by uh, uh, by producing uh, clouds um, the, the vapor trails would be visible but when they of course are dispersed they're still doing their cooling action for uh, several months so that's um, uh, so, of, so I'll, uh, I'll do that. So I'll do that. 
speaking of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, uh, David Spratt's article uh, there uh, just last week is uh, very good. And it's, it looks like uh, that would be uh, quite a good forum. And I, I think, you know, uh, finding ways to follow up on articles like David's. And uh, so I, I do encourage people to listen to the recording of his uh, talk last week with the uh, uh, Healthy Planet Action Coalition. Thanks, John. And, what, did, uh, what, did, what did David Spratt say about um, repreising the Arctic? Was it mentioned? Uh, look, uh, David was uh, very positive about geoengineering, uh, much more so than he had been in the past. And uh, so uh, it, it's uh, do have a listen to the uh, the discussion I, I will. because because he was uh, he'd been saying previously that. Uh, you know, the important thing was to accelerate our, our uh, uh, decarbonisation. Um, but uh, I think he's uh, he's changed his view and he's uh, he's recognising that accelerating decarbonisation is, is really not going to make any difference to um, uh, to tipping points. So, uh, uh, so like he was uh, quite shocked. Uh, as many were by uh, David Keith's complacency about uh, about tipping points in response to my question to David, and uh, so uh, it's it's just good to get those those sorts of uh, uh, you know to tease out those sorts of things. Now now Daniel's been wanting to to say something if you uh, if that's okay, John. Yeah yeah Hi. yep. Thanks. Go on, Daniel. Yeah, I just want to make a correction to my initial um, thoughts on. Um, Stephen Salter's uh, figures versus uh, Robert's uh, figures in terms of albedo um, change, and and uh, I just want to clarify what uh, why there was a difference and why the 0.5 percent increase um, that Stephen is <coughs> identifying is necessary, um, you know, in, in albedo is not that far off from the two percent that uh you know the 1.8 percent that robert talked about the difference um in calculations basically um stephen was looking at 0.5 percent of the 340 watts per square meter of the um energy coming in from the sun reaching the earth which actually if you calculate it, it 0.5 percent of that is 1.7 watts per meter squared which actually is virtually the, the equivalent to the loss of albedo that Roberts uh, pointed out in, um, you know, from satellite measurements over this uh, last 20 years. And actually um, the 100 figure on, on the graph that Robert had is, is the, you know, it's the total that's generally reflected and there's generally 240 watts per square meter that's absorbed by the oceans and um, the earth naturally anyway so basically that there, there wasn't such a divergence it wasn't i was almost like panicking saying oh no it's like a, not 0.5 we've got to do you know we've got to triple that or quadruple that um, but actually um to get things back to the albedo that you know predated the, the loss of the arctic sea ice probably isn't that far off the 0.5 percent increase uh if you look at it 0.5 percent of 340 uh, the total incoming um, from the sun. So that, that, I don't know if I clarified things. Uh, yeah, that makes complete sense, Daniel. It's just a question of what your denominator is, uh, whether sure. whether it's the incoming or outgoing. And uh, nice to see uh, Brian here. We've we've been going since AM, Brian. So uh, with the daylight saving change, we've uh, had another hour. But uh, John uh, was uh, uh, very complimentary about your comments about the uh, uh, potential to uh, add sulfur to uh, uh, airplane uh, fuel across the Arctic as as a uh, brightening experiment. So we, we had a bit of a chat about that. Um, so uh, nice to see you. We, uh, um, over to you, Brian. Yeah, I look forward to catching up and apologies. I'll have to get my calendar time zones uh, resolved with all the time disruptions. I, I think there was a comment earlier and perhaps uh, upon reflection, uh, David Keith's position may not be reflecting the, um, the, the loss, the, the irreversibility of loss of species on our planet. And in many ways, you know, that represents a, um, a ratchet, if you will, 
in the collapse of ecosystems. And um, so we need to, I think, you know, his position about the, uh, the lack of tipping points doesn't reflect um, these irreversibilities that occur when we lose species, uh, when other things uh, occur that are runaway feedback loops and that ultimately threaten the stability of our ecosystems and the stability of our civilization. So I look forward to continuing that conversation and understanding you know, those alternative perspectives, but ultimately I think we need to do a good job of articulating the irreversibility of what's happening today and the runaway feedback loops that we're facing. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And it, it was just really very surprising that's, uh, that David was just very dubious about the uh, irreversibility argument. Uh, you know, he, he felt that um, that the sort of gradual changes that were uh, causing to, to various natural systems. Uh, well, I would, I would say that he argued that, uh, that they would be reversible, that the, that the earth system is just far more robust than the, than the tipping point theory um suggests and uh, a number of people have have uh, uh really challenged his his argument there so i think it's really helpful to get that out i i, I reached out to johan rockstrom at the potsdam institute who's uh, one of the top uh, world tipping point <coughs> asked him if he'd be willing to uh, debate david keith on it but i haven't got a reply from him so i'll okay. continue below. Well, no, well, I think we should continue, but if you ask the, the species that go extinct, I think they're going to call it pretty irreversible. And if you ask the people on the Maldives or uh, the Marshall Islands whose countries are going underwater, let's ask about how irreversible, how reversible that is. Uh, you know, I think there's, you know, you, you lose cultures. I mean, it, when, when things get paved over or submerged and uh, those cultures don't come back. There are information theoretic irreversibilities that take place if you lose species information and you lose cultural information. And I think there's a very strong and compelling information theoretic argument to be made, a line of reasoning saying that irreversibility matters. And we're facing that, whether it's uh, you know, the melting of the Arctic or the loss of other coupled uh, <clears throat> runaway feedback loops in the nature system, uh, there are nonlinearities. I think at some level, most, if not all scientists need to recognize <laughs> those uh, nonlinear loops and uh, let's hope we can build that consensus going forward. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, while, while Peter Wadhams is here, there's a, a, a positive feedback loop that I don't think has got much attention. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in the Arctic, uh, when, we, when we lose the uh, Arctic sea ice, uh, we uh, destabilize the jet stream and uh, that results in weather extremes. That is not generally acknowledged in the IPCC uh, uh, and uh, many climate scientists will kind of deny, will deny that is happening um, uh, or, or put some other explanation in. I think uh, man, man um, Michael Mann puts a different uh, explanation. He produces a different model to produce that effect rather than the, the one that Jennifer Francis produced. But there's a, there's a positive feedback effect. When, they, when the polar vortex uh, wanders, it gets, uh, it's, that air mess gets replaced by warmer air. And that warmer air further reduces this temperature gradient between the Arctic and lower latitudes. So, so that, that's a positive feedback loop, which is extremely dangerous because it's going to lead to a completely new reconfiguration of the uh, air circulation, at least in the north, northern hemisphere. I, I don't know what's going on in the southern hemisphere, but something's going wrong, uh, very much wrong there as well. But we can identify this one very clearly in the Northern Hemisphere. There's a real danger of irreversible effect. Uh, now, uh, 
Yeah, Jonathan and Daniel. Well, uh, can, can I just see whether uh, get a response from Peter on that one? Uh, well, I'll say that uh, um, when you look at feedback loops, um, something that again people don't often realise is that that any any process like that <coughs> can last for a long time, thousands of years. So if you look at um, some of the uh, um, the feedbacks associated with with heating or of the Arctic, then you just you can't just say, oh well, uh, it's we've we've got a we've got a coolie going on here, we've got a heating going on. When you look at how long these effects last, it's it's often thousands of years. You you can't you you can't look at global processes as if they're um, uh, the the things that will will go away or can be cured or something like that, that you're stuck with them. And um, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a very nice uh, book called 50 Ways to Save the World, which I, uh, it's a kind of a slightly, uh, slightly elementary, um, but he keeps making this point, look, we, we shouldn't say, uh, that some changes is, is seems to be happening because that change is going to be there and embedded in, in, in the development of the planet for thousands of years. And so we better watch out, in other words. <clears throat> I'm afraid I have to leave. My, I've got a problem with my leg, which is really uh, yeah. giving me a lot of problems at the moment. Um, so uh, I... I um, thanks. Going... Well, thanks very much for joining, Peter. Uh, really nice to see you, and uh, hope we can uh, see you again soon. Are, are you going back to the UK uh, shortly? Uh, well, I'm. I'm in, I'm in uh, Italy at the moment, but I'm, I'm going to be visiting Scotland in a couple of weeks and seeing uh, Stephen, and um, so I, I uh, hope I can. Uh, have some useful conversations with him, and um, then then I, I have to get some more treatment on my leg. Or so. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be in London on the twentieth of May, and uh, and then coming back uh, in the first week of of June. So uh, uh, eager to to, uh, to catch up with anyone who's um, who's available to um, to uh, and, uh, say hello. So uh, if uh, if that's possible, and then uh, possibly uh, Cambridge and a couple of other places, uh, not not completely sorted as yet. So uh, I, I I hope you can have a a day of presentation or something or discussion in Cambridge that uh, people like myself can go to. Uh, I'm in Bath, which is quite a long way from. Cambridge, uh, several hours driving. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, but you know, I could drive up the previous night, spend a night, and then go home afterwards. Drive home afterwards. That's that's the kind of thing I would like to do. Um, and it'd be marvelous if that could be arranged. But you, yeah, you've given, uh, sev uh, uh, you've given sure. several days. Uh, then it might be possible. John Fitzgerald was keen on that, but uh, I uh, asked him about it, and uh, he hasn't got back to me, so I'll, I'll pester him again. Uh, yeah, I'll do do that because because my calendar is filling up rapidly. So <laughs> right, okay, <laughs> that, that'll be uh, about the fourth of June. Yeah. Great. All right. Okay, you've got to go, Peter. So yes. Bye -bye. Good. Yeah. Good. See you again shortly. Thank you. Okay. All right, let's go back to Jonathan. Hey there, thanks. Well, he, well, here's two here's two subjects that are tantalizingly similar to our actual project. The sunblock, the use of sunblock creams versus getting a sunburn, and the use of sunglasses uh, to protect the eyes. So it turns out that it's not mm. st statistically significant 
the, the fact of sunblocks actually reducing the amount of skin cancer. In, in the past, uh, in fact, it was very bad because it didn't have the kind of ingredients we have now. It would slow down a sunburn, but it wouldn't uh, block all the frequencies that would possibly create the cancers. And now it's better, but even now, even with, with tests, uh, it's, it's still kind of insignificant statistically. So when you talk to somebody, you can say, well, you know, do you put on uh, sunblock when you, when you go out in the sun for a couple of hours? They go, of course I do, of course I do. And then you can point out, well, you know, it's not, you know, statistically significant in keeping you from getting cancer. In fact, if you didn't put any on, you'd have to leave the sun in 20 minutes because you don't like that, that red sunburn. So, so, you know, why don't you apply the same thinking to your, your sunburn as you do to, you know, cooling the planet a little bit. And it turns out to be the same with sunglasses. It's, 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 it's unclear whether uh, globally, you know, cataracts are, are less uh, because when people wear sunglasses, they generally go out in the direct sunlight for many more hours than they would if they, they didn't wear sunglasses. And the same with the sunblock. If you can only be out in the sun for 20 minutes before getting a burn, but if you put on the sunblock, you can go out for four hours, you're exposing your, your skin, the parts of your skin that don't have sunblock, you know, the top of your head, you're exposing your retinas to much more sun than you would feel safe doing uh, without the sunblock. So we could bring these things up, you know, uh, sunblock lotions and sunglasses, and then point out to people that, hey, you know, statistically, these things uh, aren't doing exactly what you want. They may not be keeping you from long-term danger uh, of the sun, and they're encouraging you to do more time in the sun and then you could point out, but you're still going to use them, aren't you? Yeah, I'm definitely, I, I don't go anywhere without sunblock. So, you know, it's, it's like if we can reduce, if we can show them that there's other areas of life that are similar to what we're, we're proposing and point out that they're making the obvious choice to do the protective action against the emergency, which would be the sunburn. If, if we can see them making that choice, even though there is a, a, a potential for a backfire effect or uh, other type of effect. I think maybe we can loosen them up on the overall idea. I, I don't think that that's true, that uh, use of sunscreen has no health benefit. It, it, it seems it does uh, reduce the incidence of melanoma, but that's, uh, yeah. that's, a, that's another debate. Um, look, uh, thanks. In, please. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Daniel. Is that a webinar going on? Um, so is, is Ron talking? I just, I think the, the, it's just, uh, all right. Um, yeah, I just, um, I was just going to um, bring out the subjects of AI. And uh, I just think it's something that's making such an impact now with the chat GPT. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm do a day job in a in a marketing role for a recruitment software company. Um, a lot of people in the recruitment industry now, like eighty percent of recruiters, are using it virtually all the time to generate things. Um, there's something called uh, Auto GPT, and I know that Elon Musk, for instance, is calling on a moratorium, calling for a moratorium on any further development because you can already with Auto GPT you can have um basically it's like two supercomputers talking to each other discussing what to do next to complete a task <laughs> and um i don't know how effective but it basically um, i'm just wondering how um either ai is gonna help enhance arguments for action that's sort of sensible action on climate change or it could be used for disinformation on that but i think it's quite a powerful thing uh that's obviously affecting virtually every sector and every sphere of um research and and, and science now probably so um i'm just wondering um yeah, th thanks for raising it daniel look it's it's a really yeah. good point uh, i i just um uh, a couple of days ago uh, opened up uh, chat gpt and uh asked it some questions about um the use of uh, ai for uh, uh, cooling and um, how AI uh, relates to various specific uh, cooling technologies and uh, got got back uh, some very interesting 
uh, answers. Like it, what it does is that it it synthesizes information that's out there um, and uh, and presents it in a fairly coherent way. And uh, so uh, so getting a, a sense of what the what the science is saying, for example, about um, whether uh, AI could be used. Uh, it's it's one that I've been pondering uh, quite a bit because the the argument that Stephen Salter has raised is that um, uh, MCB offers the potential to uh, specifically target um, location of uh, cooling in order to uh, to deliver uh, desired effects. So uh, so for example, if it was possible to uh, target the timing, location and intensity of uh, marine cloud brightening in the Pacific Ocean to uh, optimise the, um, uh, the, the reduction of the, um, the El Nino effect, then uh, the, uh, the whole use of uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, to assist with that uh, deployment just seems to be uh, an, an essential feature. And so uh, the uh, the theme that I've been uh, discussing for a few years now is uh, regulating the atmosphere, and uh, and the point being that um, uh, sorry, I'll uh, just have... yeah. So uh, sorry to uh, the interruption there. Um, so, like, if we talk about saying that we need to um, evolve globally in order to uh, to regulate the atmosphere, in order to uh, to prevent uh, dangerous climate climate change, then uh, AI is just going to be um, a central um, tool in the arsenal for uh, for that work. Okay. And um, just wondering, did you have access to um, ChatGPT4, which is the one that's got up to date access to the internet? Because um, ChatGPT3 only has up to 2021, which is quite an interesting divergence, uh, apparently. Okay. Um, I've now got access to GPT4 for, for, through my work. So um, I could actually. Uh, use that. Um, in fact, I can just try now if I'm, I'm logged in. Say how how can AI help cool the planet to combat climate change? See what comes of that. With that's a very vague one, but uh, it's uh, yeah, it's now writing it. Could do a so I could do a screenshot. I could just put this into the chat. It's answer. It's coming up with an answer right now. <laughs> it's, mind you, it's um. I think I need to steer away from conventional stuff. It's coming up with optimizing, you know, obviously renewable energy, smart agriculture, climate modeling, carbon capture and storage, efficient transportation, efficient energy. I think I have to, I mean, energy efficiency, but it's not yet come up with any sort of uh, anything about um, SRM, for instance. This is probably just mirroring uh, society's perspective on emission reduction, yes, but lack of sufficient emphasis on re removal, carbon removal, and lack of sufficient um, emphasis on climate repair as being essential. So it's kind of a mm -hmm. mirror of society, if you will. Yeah, sounds like it. I'd like to go back to one of the previous discussion items, which was on uh, moral hazard. Okay, the I think it's some a topic that's worthy of more discussion and more emphasis, and having people realize that the discussion on moral hazard in itself could be a moral hazard. I mean, there's a there's ways of push pushing this around to, so that it's not something that's going to have people preventing us from doing something because it's the moral hazard if you're 
if you're going to be launching it in massive ways and stuff like that, but for the trial periods and stuff like that, quite honestly, so few people are doing anything to reduce their carbon footprint. And they're certainly not getting behind the issue of carbon removals. Then the, the action which has the prospect of the global cooling should get some attention. And the, there's a moral hazard of, of decarbonization, which prevents us from doing something which we should be doing. That's just a, a thought. I don't know where it'll lead to, but uh, um, something for further discussion, I think, at some later date, at whatever. Yeah, it's a very good point, uh, Paul, and uh, and setting it out in uh, in a coherent way is uh, in a persuasive way is is quite a challenge. Now uh, we usually uh, finish... I, yeah, Sorry, I'd yeah. just like to summarise very quickly on on that that we do we do need some way of addressing the the um, general public, in particular the climate activists who believe implicitly in IPCC as providing the science. What do you say to them? Uh, that they're, they're, they're really dead keen on footprints and uh, reducing their energy and all that kind of thing. Uh, I, you know, I have a friend who's like, like this and I just don't know what to say to him. It's... <laughs> You know, it's it's not going to work. Um, uh, and then you'll say, of course, it's going to work. If, you know, IPCC says that's what we've got to do. It's, it's it's very difficult to know what we've cut through that. Um, and I, I think one thing that might is that the IPCC is it has been taken over by the fossil fuel industry uh, very surreptitiously. They, they rule the roost, decide what uh, government policies are as far as climate change is concerned. All, so they, they know that decarbonisation uh, is going to be slow, <laughs> very, very slow. So they're not worried about you know, campaigns on decarbonisation because they know they know they'll be pretty ineffective in real terms. So that's it's a, a very, possibility. It's a very complex uh, argument, John, and uh, I know that that's something that's uh, that uh, that comes out of um, the uh, the critique of uh, of Nordhaus that we've uh, that we've previously discussed, mm. but. Um, yeah, I, I'd be interested to just uh, sort of explore that a bit more in terms of uh, whether it makes sense and what the interests are, because uh, I, I think um, it, it's it really would be in, in the interests of the the fossil fuel industry to support um, geoengineering, and uh, but they don't, and uh, so it's uh, it's quite a puzzle. Uh, and and one that's uh, and you know this this is the the thing that the opponents say uh look if you if the uh if the fossil fuel industry supports it then it must be terrible but the fossil fuel industry doesn't support it so uh, so it's quite a uh, a complicated situation now we've we've reached the end of our usual time uh, i'm happy to uh, to continue for another 15 minutes or so if, if people would like to but uh, uh, and uh, be interested to hear from uh, from others who uh, who haven't contributed so much um, but uh, I, I, I must leave soon so okay. just another five minutes would be would yeah let, let's 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 just um uh, I'd, I'd be interested if rebecca or rebecca had uh, had any uh, 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 thoughts to share? Um, well, I just keep my eyes peeled for natural solutions, like um, simple things. Maybe like I saw this thing on Instagram where someone had a leaf and it was spewing out ink. Like it was just a natural process. It was called like the manganine effect. 
and it was coating the surface of the water like automatically just by the forces of physics and so I thought well could there be solutions like that to protect reservoirs or something it would be really low investment of money just more people's labor people who are standing around doing nothing you know but want to have some agency to do something about the problem i like solutions like that you know because if we're doing if we're like using fossil fuels to make clouds we're going to be doing that forever and it's kind of like bailing out a boat with a teaspoon so if people like you know, what's a pleasant activity that people could do that, that they feel like is something good for the environment, like saving ourselves. Um, we're doing, you know, we're putting up um, foil covered shades in our yard or, you know, just more community oriented solutions interest me. I think it's like cool to, to try to fix the Arctic, but who can go there there's no infrastructure there really for for people to be there so i don't know that's just the stuff that i think about these days Thanks i like listening much. to what you guys have to say it's really therapeutic <laughs> thanks very much rebecca and uh, look <laughs> one of the interesting things is to what extent can actions that individuals do uh, have an influence? And I, I think the biggest effect is on uh, changing thinking. And uh, if if people can uh, can do things locally that will um, encourage them to think globally, then uh, then that's uh, that's the mo that's the biggest effect of uh, of action on on personal footprint rather than uh, any uh, direct cooling effect, but thanks. Now, Rebecca Bishop, did you want to? Uh... Um, I've just been reading in the last fortnight, and I keep praying and wishing that something is going to come of the George Soros initi initiative um, or the Cambridge initiative, because um, I think that marine cloud brightening shows a better prospect at the moment for acceptance of um, testing, and if it was shown that albedo could be increased and the planet could be cooled with that, then there might be more of a opening for um, SAI if needed. I did look at one video where um, Kim Stanley Robinson, the bloke that wrote Ministry of the Future, <clears throat> was in discussion with Sir David King. Doug circulated that one. I think he said it to all of us. And um, Kim Stanley Robinson said, I'll we've always got SAI and we can get it off the shelf if needed in 2017. And I thought, um, like, that's a disaster because if we don't do any testing in the meanwhile, then we won't have it available. Um, but everyone seems to be putting it off until some future time. And I do just wish we could get going with the tests, but I'm a bit stumped as to the how of the whole thing. That's a great point, Rebecca, and I just want to add, isn't it a strange world we're living in where killer robots are being developed in China and the U.S. and other countries? <laughs> and, you know, these are very lethal uh, weapons of, of destruction and war, and yet we can't work, you know, we can't uh, raise the funds to, to repair the climate with very limited scale tests. So it seems what an odd world that we're living in where these disruptive uh, events are occurring and we can't, uh, we can't, it, it's hard to raise the, the resources needed to just really uh, fully develop marine cloud brightening even. It's a peculiar circumstance. Do you think it's yeah. human nature just to think short term and? I'd say that, you know, the amygdala uh, response is five times faster and five times the uh, impact, if you will, then uh, perhaps uh, regenerative messages of hope and love and, and all the rest. So we have to um, avoid the cheap shots, but it does explain how, you know, you get funding for defense spending and you get all the rest. It, 
it appeals to the amygdala, which instinctively humans respond to with five times the um, survival instinct, if you will, even though uh, boiling frogs slowly, which is what we're doing with the climate, is equally potent and e equally threatening. Uh, we're increasingly having to face the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I think there's a way to do that, but we need to uh, try to do that proactively to sustain civilization. Well, Brian, I love what you just said. In, in the chat, there's something from Robbie about AI and visualizations. And um, so anyway, it seems to be two things. One is to change consciousness and understand that we need to call the climate climate. And the other one is all the backroom um, work. And Robbie, when if you get to go to Cambridge, I'd be really interested to hear if there's anything progressing with the um, MCBT and Sir David King and George Soros. Anyway, that's in a week or three. Great. All right. Well, let's finish up there. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for joining, and I'll, I'll circulate the recording. Hold, hold on just, just one second here. Uh, yeah, Paul. Dr. Brian, you asked about a tea letter, Jolly Roger, and that's my area of interest. Uh, how do I just give me a call or how, how can I reach you right away? Because uh, well, I, I just saw that. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. Thank you. I can um, drop my uh, Calendly and my WhatsApp connection in the chat uh, if we just keep the call open for a short time. I'm very happy to um, talk with you about that as we're trying to build a, a sustainable biochar system uh, this season in Australia. Um, this is absolutely what I work on, and I've got things about actually how these t cook cookstoves that make biochar can help with the climate thing in the in the quarter gigaton level. Easy. I mean, it's written up okay. and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, I'll um I'll stay on after this call and we can find a, a good channel to continue the conversation. Okay. Thank I'm putting my my email address in right now. Oh good. I'll do the and, same. Okay. Well, um, we could just continue the Zoom to to talk about biochar for a bit. Uh, uh, Oh, good. Thank you. That would be great. Uh, yeah, I've got a question for Brian. Uh, at the last meeting, we you you put up a document uh, for us to put in contributions, but I wasn't quite sure. Uh, was that document to include your proposal for um, uh, contrails? Uh, I think so. Uh, I, I, it is something that we should do, and I'm happy to collaborate with this group and more um, to actually refine that document. So I'm very, very much interested in following up on that and seeing where we can take that in the days and weeks ahead. Yeah. Okay, because I, I was not sure wh whether I should contribute on that particular subject or, or just more generally on an, an argument for refreezing the uh, for re refreezing the Arctic perhaps. Well, let's put it in, in context. I think it, it's worth including both. Um, I'd recommend using suggestion mode and what we can do is um, you know review the suggestions and uh, refine it into a document that can be a working document going forward. So I'm um, happy to enable that and uh, help to curate the, um, the, the development of uh, a good written Piece. Yeah. Uh, what really I've indeed. already suggested earlier on the meeting is that I would write to the uh, atomic um, scientists uh, because uh, to um, to to reinforce the um, the, the idea of refreezing the Arctic for, for them because uh, they're concerned about that they, they had a very good a very good letter was sent to them by uh, I think it was David Sp Spratt who wrote to them and uh, I think we could kind of respond. Oh, the other thing that they, they got was a, a letter from 60 scientists, including James Hansen, about the need for SRM. Uh, I think we could uh, reinforce that message. Yeah, I heard there were more okay. than 100 signatures now. I haven't looked recently, but I was encouraged by the uptake of that letter. Mm. 
Yeah. Perhaps David Keith even no. was, know, or was a uh, co Brian, are you the key guy with this thing about the... About the what? Uh, Brian, are you the key guy with this thing about the, about the uh, uh, contrails for, for over the Arctic? I'm, well, I'm looking I, for some graphics about that. Is there something for putting a PowerPoint? I think it's early days. We should probably produce some graphics as part of our writing exercise. But uh, John Nissen has helped to really spearhead this. I'm not hearing I'm anything. To, I'm happy to contribute my knowledge uh, uh, on this area and atmosphere in the Arctic as well. So I think we need to come together and uh, offer some suggestions as to a research framework, really for helping to refreeze the Arctic and helping to stabilize the jet stream uh, in a responsible way and have it discussed by civil society as well as funded at limited scale to do the early research experiments. So uh, yeah, I think we have a working document on okay. that and hopefully someone can share, share that uh, so link in the- my, my, my email in the chat and I look forward to getting a connect uh, something from you. Good. Okay. I'll pull up right after this and we can stay on the call uh, briefly afterwards mm -hmm. and continue the conversation on biochar briefly.